okay. I love to start and take all, but I can see the chat is already beat me to it. So, um, I see where you are, where you are uh, calling in from today. That would be wonderful. I love all of the diversity that I see. People from Kansas, Idaho, Wisconsin, Colorado, Dayton, Ohio. Um, I'm calling in from Atlanta, Kentucky, Vermont, Virginia, San Francisco. That used to be my home, uh, Central Florida. So Los Angeles, well, as you can see, we have a diverse crowd and I am excited to share this um, lovely topic with you all. So today we're going to talk about exploring gender, sexuality, and identity. I am Sharika Ekpo and I will be your facilitator and guide today. And I would like to welcome you to our cultural learning community where we will explore all things sexuality and identity. Just a little bit about me to get started. Um, I am the uh, CEO of Shaw Ekpo Enterprises, which is a consulting firm that is centered on training, uh, human resources and diversity, equity and inclu uh, inclusion consulting. I have been in industry uh, for about 20 years where I spent five years in finance, uh, 10 years in the federal government and four years in the technology space. And that's when I had my other life in San Francisco. Um, and most recently, I served as the chief diversity officer of a software company called Anaplan. Um, and there, um, you know, we did a lot around our work with our pride ERGs and other communities to ensure that we were always being inclusive, especially as we had um, employees on 17 um, in 17 different countries. I am excited to share some of my experiences with you because I've worked with some Fortune 100 companies like J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Google, General Electric and the White House. But let me share a few things about me that you can't find on my resume or in LinkedIn. I am a cisgender black woman who was raised in Washington, DC. My pronouns are she and her. I currently reside in Atlanta, whoop whoop, with my husband and children. I'm a first generation American. So my parents are Jamaica and Barbados, uh, two small islands, and I am a first generation uh, college graduate. I shared all of that with you all in hopes of finding some levels of connection um, to let you know more about who I am and my identity. Because today we're gonna talk about building a culture of belonging. And in order to do that, we must understand our identities and ensure that we create an inclusive environment for everyone. All right, let's move on to our goals and objectives. So fundamental to the AmeriCorps mission is the obligation to honor the diversity of all stakeholders by treating everyone with respect and dignity. So this course today will be, provide you with a better understanding of gender and sexual identity related terms. And we will introduce inclusive language signals that are welcoming and respectful for all. Secondly, we will spark curiosity and explore sexuality and intersectionality. Third, we hope that you will increase your knowledge base and learn how to be more, how to use more inclusive language and what the value of allies really is. And then finally, we wanna create a safe space here. While this is a large webinar and we may not be able to come off mute, I hope that you hear or see something that will get you thinking more about who you are and hopefully encouraging you to share more about all of your identities and bringing your full self to the core or to uh, your work. All right, so before we get started, we're gonna set some ground rules. We wanna ensure that everyone that you feel comfortable, your honesty, speak your truth. And in that case, may not be speaking on this call, but it is about in your communities when you go back to your desk and jobs out in the community, you need to prioritize and be present. I thank you all for being here because I recognize that we're working with a lot of things. It's Friday Eve, as I like to say, so it's all here and now. We wanna seek opportunities to build connection, reserve judgment of ourselves and others. We wanna embrace new possibilities and expand perspectives. And finally, accept, accept non-closure. There may be some terms or some things that you hear today that you are hearing for the first time, or that you don't necessarily agree with, and that's okay. But I just ask that you remain open-minded so that we can actually 
understand how to create this inclusive environment that we all seek and love. All right, so before we get started, I wanna set a little context. Um, do we have the poll question ready? And if not, we can go straight to the video and we can talk about it after. All right, here's the poll question. I wanna make sure that this is an engaging and connective experience for you all. So how many of you are familiar with the lavender scare? And that was where gay and lesbian Americans were barred from being employed in the government. All right, so right now, I would love to get some thank you for the participation. We're gonna wait another 15 seconds hands to answer the question. Have you heard about the lavender scare and what that is? Oh, awesome. And the training several years ago. Love it, love it, love it. All right, so um, the poll is in and 62% of the audience said they are, are just going to be learning about it for the first time. So let's take a, let's go over to the video and learn a little bit more about what the Lavender Scare is, how it started and how we can actually ensure that it doesn't happen again. Think you know all about the fear campaigns that gripped the nation during the Cold War? The Red Scare, the congressional witch hunt against communism. Well, think again, because there was a second scare that may have had a longer and much more direct impact on many people's lives. Beginning in the late 1940s, the Lavender Scare was a campaign to systematically remove anyone thought to be LGBTQ plus from the government. Post Second World War, young Americans began to migrate to the cities. Underground gay communities were established and began to flourish. There was a growing fear of homosexuality in the United States, and it was illegal across much of the country. In the era of the Cold War, LGBTQ plus people were seen as immoral and subversive, prone to dangerous influences. It was thought they posed a security risk to the nation. And when Senator Joseph McCarthy linked homosexuality to communism during a Red Scare congressional speech, it fueled the firestorm of the Lavender Scare. The government launched two congressional investigations. The first sought information into what it called the infiltration of subversives and moral perverts into the executive branch. The second collected data on the extent of gay and lesbian government employees and urged federal agencies to strictly enforce existing policy on moral standards. These investigations ultimately led President Dwight Eisenhower to sign Executive Order 10450, which banned gays and lesbians from employment in the federal government. In 1957, Frank Kameny was fired from the U.S. Army Map Service for his sexuality. He took his case to court, and though he lost, he went on to become a lead campaigner for gay rights finally receiving an apology in 2009. And at age 90, Helen James successfully sued the Air Force for her undesirable discharge from service in 1955 because of her sexual orientation. Over the decades, thousands of LGBTQ plus people were fired from their jobs and publicly humiliated. The ban remained in place until 1975, when the Civil Service Commission finally reversed it. All federal agencies followed suit in 1998, when U.S. President Bill Clinton signed Executive Order 13087, prohibiting employment discrimination based on sexual orientation. When, if ever, is it appropriate for a government to intrude on the private lives of its employees? What are your thoughts? Would love to hear a few thoughts in the chat. What's interesting is President Eisenhower signed Executive Order 10450, which barred gay and lesbian Americans from being employed by the federal government. And that was not reversed until 
the Civil Rights Commission came in, and in 1998, the Executive Order 13087 was signed by President Bill Clinton. So when I think about this, right, the, the question at the end of the video was, when is it ever okay for government to tell us who we are and then use it as a discriminating factor to determine whether or not we should be employed? I don't know about you, but I'm really has not existed and that people are able to showcase and bring their whole selves to work. When I think about, um, let's move to the next slide and let's really start to dive into some of these terms and some of the, um, the, the things that have impacted the letter scare and more importantly have now introduced into a law, the Lavender Law. So I'm looking at some of the comments and I see some information here about an annual conference and such. So thank you all for sharing the information in the chat and keep coming. When we think about understanding gender, right? We are going to go through a couple of definitions, right? We wanna look at what it means, um, what the academic definitions of sexuality and identity are, Definitions and concepts around uh, biological sex, gender roles, gender expression. And more importantly, we want to get to the point where we're moving beyond the binary, okay? Um, the world as we know it continues to evolve, and we want to make sure that our language is evolving with it. All right. Gender is fluid across different cultures and historical periods. So when we look at this definition, gender is described as the social, cultural, and psychological traits, roles, behaviors, and identities society considers appropriate for an individual based on their perceived or assigned sex at birth. What's so interesting is there's so much ambiguity and objectivity that goes into this definition around gender. So when you think about gender and it's a question on an application, there are some who are conflicted about answer the question. And that's because some of the boxes that we to do, they don't identify with. However, what we can find is that a typical response may be male, female, non-binary, et cetera. But some may feel comfortable writing their pronouns in instead. Let's go to the next slide. Gender identity, I'm go back, I'm sorry. Gender identity. When I think about gender identity, right? It includes an individual's internal self of self and how they feel. It's defined as an individual's earned internal, deeply held sense of their gender, which can be male, female, a blend of both, neither, or something else. It's also the psychological identification that may or may not align with the individual's biological sex and is influenced by the combination of biological, psychological, and social factors. Gender identity is the way that someone expresses themselves to the outside world. Then as we move into gender roles, we all we have all seen this play out in the professional and you know, home settings, right? So when we think about gender roles, it's those societal norms and behaviors and expectations that are considered appropriate, appropriate for individuals based on their perceived or assigned gender. Their role, these are roles that are culturally or historically specific, and they dictate what is considered acceptable behavior for occupations and responsibilities or activities for um, individuals in our society. One of the things that I tell you I don't like is how I am perceived as a woman. Because as a woman, I am expected to be a caregiver. I am expected to be a housekeeper. I'm expected to be a note taker in a meeting or the, sec or the person who's answering the phone, right? I'm also expected to handle all of the emotional labor, not only just my own, but those of the members of my team. And the truth of the matter is, as a woman, people are expected to wear my emotions on my sleeve. So when I show up as Sharika Ekpo and I don't do that, right? If there are days that I want to cry, I cry. And if there are days that I want to be happy, I'm happy. But if I do not act the way 
that society expects me to, I'm different or I'm labeled. And in some cases, I try very, very difficult, actually hard to be labeled as an angry black woman. And so some of these gender roles really do um, play a role in life. But as the role assignments also comes bias. Really think about how comfortable I make other people feel. And so I, and we had to deliver bad news, but there was a hesitation to deliver that bad news to me, but not a hesitation to deliver it to my coworker who was a male by the way, or man, because he was expected to handle his emotion, emotions um, more internally or suppress them more than I would have. Listen, as a group and as allies, as members of the LGBTQ plus community, as members of this inclusion coalition that we are creating, we must challenge and redefine these expectations because it is our job to make sure that we move beyond these uh, traditional roles that have been thrust upon us. This next slide really does um, compare gender versus biological sex. And the Venn diagram really gives us a, a, a real visual about the differences um, such as being social and psychological construct for gender while biological sex is defined by biological classifications like chromosomes and reproductive organs. This Venn diagram shows the overlap where both can be related to oneself and the impact that social roles and expectations may have on their behavior. It's also important to note that when we talk about gender, we have to use language. So referring to me, for instance, as a woman is what I prefer. Don't call me a female, okay? Because when I think about being a female, that gets to be seen as a derogatory term. And it doesn't acknowledge my full identity. Female is more of a biological term that refers to sex. All right. Let's move into the next slide. Because the next slide talks about the impacts of gender roles and stereotypes in society. And so we know this exists. We know that there's occupational segregation, right? But we have to move beyond this. We have to move beyond the binary to ensure that we are creating these inclusive spaces because being siloed um, and biased can really create to some unintentional impact and perpetuate stereotypes. So stereotypes that often leads to this division of labor that we talk about with occupational segregation right? Leadership and technical roles, while women are often stirred towards being caregivers and administrative lower paying positions. But you know what that does? It perpetuates the gender pay gap. I will never forget moving to San Francisco and we moved into our neighborhood and I had a neighbor come out and ask me, uh, hey, what brought you to the area? And I simply responded with work. And she proceeds to say, oh, your husband got a new job? I said, no, we moved from DC to, to the Bay Area for my job. But there was just an expectation that if the family was moving across country or, or uprooting ourselves and going to another part of the country, that it had to be for my husband's high paying job, but it couldn't be for mine. And that, those are the types of stereotypes that we need to continue to fight against. There are also stereotypes about gender abilities that significantly impacts self-esteem and confidence. For instance, women may internalize stereotypes such as being less competent in fields in science and math, right? And we know that can lead to lower confidence which hinder participation in certain fields. And similarly, men may feel pressure to conform to having to be more dominant and unemotional which limits their ability to express vulnerability. I cannot tell you how many times as a as an executive coach, as a member of the C-suite, I talk to some of my counterparts who happen to be men and we they struggle with showing vulnerability because that's not the way society sees them. But what we know is that true leadership involves a level of vulnerability. 
Gender stereotypes also perpetuate discrimination in the workplace um, where we think about how we are supposed to, what we're supposed to be good at. And in fact, it impacts hiring. So while I was at the United States Digital Service, I served as the head of people operations. And I will never forget, we had um, an opening come available for um, our, one of our communities of practice. And because like many other technical uh, industries and um, companies, we were more male dominated. I looked at my applicant women who had a well what did I do I went around who I knew were capable but who may not see themselves as checking off one I'm sorry not checking off any of all of the boxes for the job description let's say there were 10 boxes on the job description and this person this woman thought that maybe she only identified with six of them or for I went around to them, made sure that I had conversations and encouraged them to apply anyway. Why? Because there were other people who were coming to me that said, hey, I know I don't have it all, but I can learn it. I can do it. And that uh, that sense of confidence definitely um, has been is eroded over time because we are told that we have to stay with a certain land. What I know is that this kind of behavior reinforces uh, inequality. And so when I think about gender roles and stereotypes reinforcing societal inequalities, it help, it maintains the status quo of the power dynamics that exist. For instance, traits typically associated with leadership and assertiveness are often considered masculine, right? Um, while collaborative and empathy are really undervalued and really thrust upon women that bias can marginalize women and gender minorities in leadership roles, perpetuating a cycle of inequality and actually leading to low leadership representation. And then finally, when I think about the impact on mental health, conforming to the restrictive gender roles can have a negative impact on how we feel about ourselves. Men, for instance, may suffer from stress and anxiety due to societal pressures to be the primary breadwinner or to suppress their emotions, right? How many times have you, we had the neighbor in California who thought we were moving for my husband's job based and, and not mine, right? There is this underlying tone that men are supposed to be breadwinners. And in fact, that is a societal expectation that we need to break. Overall, gender plays a large role in representation, whether at home or at work. So we must do our best to create psych psychologically safe environments for everyone. Sharika? Yes. I yeah, I think we're having some connectivity issues um, and it may be coming from your side because um, we, we have a number of, of people that are saying they're having some glitching going on. With, do you want to try turning off your camera? Um, sure. We, uh, we're seeing a little bit, yeah, we're having some some connectivity going in and out. My apologies for interrupting. No problem. I am so sorry. No, it's okay. I think we're just we're 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 all trying to figure that out. So yeah, thank you all so much for bringing that to our attention. Um, please continue, Sharika. Oh wow, thank you so much for letting us know, Stem. And 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 apologies. I'm so sorry. Okay, we're gonna keep keep going here, um, so that we can stay on track. But we're gonna move into exploring. Uh, sexuality. This quote, as we were, as I was thinking about this topic, and please let me know, I'm going to pause. Can everyone hear me? Thumb um, or am I still going in and out? Okay. I see thumbs. Okay. The presentation. Is, okay. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you all so much. Look, I just messed up. I said, thank you guys. We got to fix that language. It's thank you team. Thank you everyone. Thank you colleagues. All right, let's go. The quote on the screen, our sexuality is not an isolated entity, but an integral part of our overall personalities emphasizes that sexuality isn't just a separate compartmentalized aspect of life but it is connected to and influences many other aspects of, of our identity, emotions, thoughts, behaviors, and interactions, right? And so Sigmund Freud challenged us to think about what sexuality really means to us. 
It is a key component of what makes us who we are. It, in, it affects how we view ourselves. It affects how we relate to others, how we experience love and intimacy, how we navigate social and cultural norm, norms. It influences all of our personal values, relationships, and even our decision-making processes. Thoughts of, I couldn't be who I normally am then team would not benefit from all of the experiences that I have of being a first generation American, of being a first generation college student, of you know having lived in four different states, right? So we need to think about what some of those aspects identity mean, but they also wouldn't benefit from me being a cisgender cisgendered woman, which also brings a certain amount of um, care and feeding to my leadership style. think about exploring sexuality, the academic meaning is the complex range of desires, behaviors, identities, and orientation related to sexual attraction, behavior, and emotional intimacy. It encompasses sexual orientation, heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, asexuality, your sexual practices, and the way in which individuals experience and experience themselves as so as we talked about in the lavender scare, we saw that there was a time where employees in the federal government couldn't bring their whole selves to work. And so we saw this discrimination in the military. We saw this discrimination in the workplace. And when you think about this, it really, it really, um, it really hurts me personally, because if I, if you can't be yourself at a place where you spend eight to 12 hours a day, then how can you truly operate in greatness. One of the things that I loved um, learning more about as we continue to evolve as a country is that, you know, in 2021, the U.S. Census began asking questions about sexuality of its citizens. So we can talk, go back to the 1950s and such with uh, the lavender scare, or we can and focus on that, or we can talk about the evolution of this and look at how the US Census Bureau and others are really embracing the sexuality and thinking more about how they understand, how we understand our citizens. And it's also important to share younger generations. The data is showing that younger generations are much more aware of the different sexualities and they're more likely not to identify as straight. So as you think about being out in the community, in the core, right, there are people who are going to be there transitioning. There are folks that are going to be um, transgender. Um, there are who be straight. That should not matter. That part of the city has nothing to do with service, has nothing to do with how they will contribute as a team. That we continue to and understand how to be inclusive so that we can all support each other. This list here just goes into the types of sexual orientation that we are exploring. And what I will tell you is there's no simple binary on or off switch that easily shows or represents any of this. Different people can be attractive for different reasons, um, which may overlap and or intersect. So this, the different types of sexualities in society today is not an exhaustive list. It's rather just a sample of the orientations that exist. But I will ask you in the chat, are there some identity sexual orientations that are missing from this list? I know I can think of a few. Are there some sexualities that are missing? You can type them in the chat. One that, one that comes to mind, but let's read the, what we have on the screen first. So right now, absolutely. On this, on the screen here, we have heterosexual, which is the attraction to individuals of the opposite gender, homosexual, bisexual, attraction to both, asexual, lack of sexual uh, attraction to others, pansexual, attraction to people regardless of their gender, queer, a broad identity that encompasses a range of sexual orientation, 
and gender identities that are not strictly heterosexual or cisgender. Questioning, exploring, or unsure about one's sexual orientation, and I'm definitely seeing that a lot more um, as children are moving through adolescence. And then demisexual, which is the attraction to that only occurs after a strong emotional bond has been formed. So I thank you for um, for these uh, in the chat where I see um, some different uh, sexualities that are listed there. And and to to you all's point, polysexual the attraction to multiple but not necessarily all genders. Um, scoliosexual is the attraction to non-binary, queer gender, or transgender individuals. But I will tell you, as I was doing some additional research on this, because or, sexual orientation continues to evolve. It's fluid. I have a, a link to um, an organization called Cultural Ally, where I found over 26 different types of sexualities. But that's not all, okay? I know there's this is a constant evolution but i think it's important for us to understand where we are today and make sure that we are aware of the different orientations that exist just in case we are called in or there is some support that's needed um, for our members in the field raise your hand if you've seen this flag before omnisexual absolutely transsexual I'm hearing that the it's still bad. Um, okay. I apologize for doing this, but wanted to ask my tech team if it made sense for me to log off and try to log back in to see if that helps with the connection or if we should keep going. All right. I, I hear you, Alicia. We're going to keep going. So... The LGBTQ plus flag on the screen is known as the Progress Pride flag. It incorporates the traditional rainbow flag, which symbolizes diversity and inclusion across the LGBTQ plus community with additional stripes to represent marginalized groups within the community. So the rainbow stripes, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, vi and violet stripes remain from the traditional pride flag, which represent life, healing, sunlight, nature, serenity, and spirit. The chevron on the left side of the flag um, includes black and brown stripes representing people of color and their importance uh, in their place in the LGBTQ plus community. The light, pink, light blue and white stripes are taken from the transgender pride flag. Those colors represent transgender individuals with pink and blue symbolizing traditional gender roles and white representing those who are non-binary or gender non-conforming. This design highlights the need for progress, especially in terms of inclusion and inclusion in marginalized members of the LGBTQ plus community. And I, um, we definitely, I live in Atlanta. And so I love right here in the city, there are so many businesses that are just out and with a pride flag right at the floor. And I did not realize that there are different parts of not even just the city, but of course our state um, where people are still not welcomed in 2024. And I guess I should know that, right? Because I have my own set of um, marginalized identities but it's just hard to believe that one, we're still fighting, we're still fighting for the same things, but together we can make a difference. All right, well, let's move into identity and intersectionality because as I think about who we are, we also have to think about how we are perceived by our communities. I, we're going to introduce intersectionality. We're going to talk about how gender, sexuality, race, and identity intersect. We'll go over a quick video that talks about intersectional identity and experiences. And then we will have a group activity where you can create your own identity flower. And we'll talk a little bit about how our personal identities um, may show up in forms of oppression.
the academic or textbook definition of identity is the concept of who a person is, encompassing the various characteristics, roles, beliefs, and values that define an individual and their sense of self. Now, when you think about this, there are all different types of identities, gender identity, sexual identity, cultural identity, religious identity, personal identity. So are there identities that you see here uh, that that are not shown here, I'm sorry, that you I that you would like to see? Of course, this is just a sample of the identities and we'll hopefully we'll get into more um, in just a minute, but would love to know if there are some identities that pop you look of uh, six sexual, cultural, ethnic, or gender. Type a few in the chat. So ethical identity, that's that's real. Um, and more so in um, you know, other countries as well. Neurodiversity. Thank you, Adam. Absolutely. Um let's move slide as you all start thinking about more identities, national identity. Let's move to the video and hear from our Aria, it's so good to have you here today. So we're going to be talking about who we are and what makes us up is unique and varied. Yeah, sounds good. So to kick things off, how would you describe yourself? Oh, hard question. Um, well, I'm a person of color. I have a chronic illness mm -hmm. and I'm disabled. So when you're naming those things, are you talking about the different intersecting parts of your life experience? Yeah, pretty much. I think those are the different parts which make me, well, me. Mm. I like to think of them as a roundabout, you know, where the different yeah. streets are symbolic of the different things that I like or, well, are part of my history or heritage. Mm. For example, my disability, my race, my gender, the books I like, the games I play, yeah. everything really. Yeah, and that's what we call intersectionality. It's a really important word for all of us to know. It simply means that we're made up of a lot of things, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the best explanation I've had of what intersectionality is was with the packet of M&Ms. You know, you have all those pretty colors, but oh, I just wish I had one to show you. You know, it's funny you say that because there you go. Awesome. Let's dig in, right? Right, all so right. what have we got? We've got the greens, yellow, red, oranges, everything really, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine that somewhere in this bowl, there's one M&M which isn't just one of those colors. It's all of them at once. Yeah. It's pretty much a rainbow, right? Yeah. To me, that's what intersectionality truly is. So what you're saying is the colors in a rainbow M&M would represent maybe the language that we speak, our gender, a disability we might have, or really any other part of our identity. And the beauty of being a rainbow M&M is no two are the perfect match, right? They're all still very unique. Pretty much, but I think at the same time, right, like this brown M&M here, Ultimately, every M&M is chocolate on the inside. Everyone has an intersectional identity. Yeah. It shouldn't really be that extraordinary. Yeah, and the beautiful thing about being a rainbow M&M is you can be many things at once. Yeah. An example that I can think of is when I was in high school, I wore my traditional Pakistani clothes to my school formal. And that was one way where different parts of my identity all existed at the same time. Yeah, I think I have a story like that too. Um, what was it, year five, I want to say? Mm. I just come back from India and my school was hosting a multicultural day. So I remember that I also wore a traditional Indian outfit to school and I took this huge box of sweets my mum and I had made. But before I could give them to my friends or even walk the runway, I had one of my episodes in which, mm. you know, my vision went a bit blurry, I had a really bad headache. But because my friends and teachers knew how important it was for me mm. to get up on that stage and talk about what it means to be Bengali, what it means to be a disabled young person, they made sure that I could do it despite, yeah. you know, what I was going through. And I think that's when I really felt supported for having an intersectional identity. That's a really beautiful story. Thank you. And it reminds me of this thing a student once said. There might be one part of you that stands out most to other people, but that's not entirely who you are, right? We're made up of so many things. We have so many parts of ourselves. And sometimes we need that extra support and encouragement to be ourselves. And I mean entirely ourselves. Definitely. And I think too, whenever we meet someone new, or even when we're talking to someone whom we already know, 
it's really important to consider how their intersectional identities are played yeah. with them. And at the same time, if there's something we don't know about them, we should be willing to ask and hear their stories too. Exactly. And if we don't create space for people, then who will for us? Couldn't agree more. Exactly. All right, what are your thoughts? There were a couple of things that really, really stood out to me. Um, one of which I tell my leaders all the time, which is you have to consider how people's intersexuality is at play when they show up to work. Um, and what's so the culture work, the leadership development work that we do, a lot of leaders try to focus on quantity okay and but what Arya just talked about is qualitative data it's actually being present and able to listen to the stories of people who are different from us or different like us is what I should say we're all the same on the inside I saw somebody say that in the chat thank you Alicia we're all the exact same we may present or show differently right but we all have a heart, we all have red blood. And so I loved that video, um, but it really does speak to some of the challenges that we see when we think about individuality. And a part of my intro was cisgendered black woman. As we look at this intersectionality flower, this flower of identities. And we talked on the last slide, there were only six identities listed there. And thank you all for your engagement in the chat. There's so many other things that make up who we are. So religion, the chat, thank you. Age, disability status, gender, geography, culture, income, orientation, education, sex, language, ethnicity, and race. What's interesting is intersexuality also shows up. It shows that oppression is not one dimensional because as I show up and as I'm proud of sexuality, it can also highlight the interconnected of systems of power that create these situations that are our So let me give you an example. Different systems of power oppression, like patriarchy, racism, ableism, homophobia, they don't act. Instead, they're connected and force each other. You know, a poor transgender woman of color might face economic injustice. She may also face gender discrimination. She may also, may also have phobia and racism all at the same time. That is that will lead to a compound and unique oppression for that woman. And as we look at this identity flower, we may all have our own separate stories, right? Where we experience ableism or homophobia or racism in a different way. And so sometimes we have to check ourselves and really understand our points of privilege and how they may be showing up for others, but more importantly, be centered and open to hearing other stories and committing to create this inclusive environment. All right. Let us um, go into the, the next slide. What we are looking at is really trying to create our own intersectional map, right? And so that map that I just showed you, and you know what, if you go back to the slide above this, Misty, thank you. We're going to um, keep this up as an example because I would like for you all to do me a favor and get out a piece of paper. And I want you to create your own flower. OK, and you can simply do that by drawing a large circle and really think about 12 different dimensions that you identify with. Right. And when you look at that flower, it's so colorful and it's so nice. But really, each one of those, um, the ends of those popsicle sticks end at the same point that we would have uh, a number on a clock. And so when you think about this, and you might not have time to do it now, but I do want you to think about listing those different dimensions of your own identity, and then think about how they overlap with one another. 
And in that overlapping, how you show up day-to-day -day basis and how differently you are received when you're versus being versus being versus being at home. And hopefully understanding how you are treated and, and how you are received will give you a level of empathy to deal with people who are different like us. All right, let us move into allyship and application. This is probably the most important part of the, the uh, presentation and learning more about the terms and what they mean and how we, um, how we create the safe environment is important. And we need to take these principles and now practice what we've learned and put it into action. So when we think about practices and for ally advocacy, I am extremely delighted because I had the pleasure of working with Claire Matarana, who is the CIO and a proud member of the LGBTQ plus community. And she sits at one of the highest levels of government and is beyond supportive and does everything in her power to create an open and warm environment. I know there are other very similar um, with very similar stances and um, allyship, like Mr. Michael Smith, who's the CEO of the AmeriCorps. We appreciate his leadership and his uh, constant support. But I share all of that to let you all know that what was happening with the Lavender Scare is, there is no discrimination and bias. We can all ascend highest levels of government and really showcase who we are. But we must commit to doing the following. The first one is educating ourselves continually, right? We have to commit to an ongoing um, opportunity to learn about experiences and challenges and really think about how we understand the terminology that can impact uh, or unintentionally cause harm to those who are uh, in the minority. Number two, we have to cr create and support safe spaces. We, we have to use and respect a person's chosen name, pronouns, and avoid making assumptions about someone's gender or sexual, sexual orientation based on their preferences or their appearances, I'm sorry, their appearances or their behavior. And one of the things I can, you know, say, you know, sitting in HR, um, it, it can be difficult sometimes because there are systems that are put in place that make it difficult for, um, for people to either make health insurance selections or to change their name or to change their email address because they would like to be called something else. And so that really talks to number four about creating policies that support the LGBTQ plus rights and inclusion of that community. When we think about advocating for policies and practices that promote equality and inclusion for gender and sexual minorities, it is not if it's now, right? This can involve supporting inclusive workplace policies, practicing LGBTQ plus advocacy, voting for legislation that protects LGBTQ plus rights. And these policy changes can lead to systemic improvements and rights in the workplace and in our larger communities. What I realized is I skipped number three, which is to create, uh, to ensure that bias and discrimination um, are not tolerated. We have to actively speak up against homophobia, transphobia, and other forms of discrimination, whether it's in the workplace, social setting, or online. And this includes addressing microaggressions, right? Stereotypes, inappropriate jokes. And what I will tell you is sometimes we And there is a propensity to call people out and to embarrass them for making for calling someone the wrong pronouns or for making an insensitive comment. However, I suggest that you call someone in instead. Think about what it means to actually pull this person aside, address the issue head on, and give them recommendations and suggestions about how not to do the inappropriate behavior again. 
Challenging discriminatory behavior not only supports those that are impacted, but it helps to shift the culture towards a greater acceptance and respect for all. And then finally, we need to practice using more inclusive language. I slipped up and I said, thank you guys on the call. So what I would say is that I also want us to practice giving people grace, okay? Because improving your vocabulary, understanding the terminology, it takes practice. And with the evolution, we are all bound to make mistakes because we're human. However, we wanna encourage and participate in the creation of safe and inclusive work environments, whether it's in the community, in our social circles, or at work. And this means supporting the LGBTQ plus employee resource groups. I am proud to know that the AmeriCorps, the Pride AmeriCorps um, ERG is strong, alive, and well, and very active. Um, we need to ensure that we have inclusive facilities like gender neutral bathrooms. Um, we need to make sure that there are uh, L making spaces where LGBTQ plus individuals can share their experiences without fear of judgment, harassment, or reprisal. Unfortunately, that still exists today, but if we are able to create these safe spaces, then we can create this sense of belonging that we're all yearning for, and that will be essential to ensure that the well-being and, and the participation uh, of everyone is prioritized at its highest levels. Let's skip down to the next slide. Uh, one, go up one, did we miss a slide here? Yes, there we go, language matters. Yep, language matters. Um, I think we, we went over a few of these, but I think it, it goes without saying that we always have an opportunity to rephrase our words, right? And so it's commonplace to use the traditional ladies and gentlemen, girls and guys, but we have to get to a point where we are not labeling people that way. It is okay to say team, colleagues, or people, which is what I uh, reframed um, my words um, to use earlier. Maternity and paternity leave. I am guilty. It is just parental leave. Who cares who's taking it? It is time off that we as a country um, need to actually do more to give, right? We need more time off for caregivers um, and others, but we need to call and label it the right um, terms. When we're talking about pronouns, we're asked and you ask, what are your preferred pronouns? We should ask, what pronouns do you use? And I will tell you, I had a conversation with one of my clients the other day, and he says, you know, Sharika, th this really makes me mad. I mean, I'm, I'm adapting already, and I, 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 what difference does it make? And the change in one word can impact the way a message is received. The change in the tone of voice that we speak to someone can impact the way a message is received. And so I would encourage us to really think and ask, if you don't know, it is okay to ask how, what pronouns do you use? How should I refer to you? What do I, what can I do to be more inclusive? And really ask if you don't know. Finally, all of those, all of those type of uh, gender label terms can really be um, phrased more inclusively by just simply saying male clerk, chairperson, so on and so forth. All right, so let's now we're into key learnings and personal takeaways. I am, you know, sad that we're at this point of the, the presentation, but really hope that you something um, that you learned something today and that you have an action plan for what you can do to make sure that you are inclusive as possible and creating a sense of belonging uh, that will foster creativity and innovation in the community and on the teams. So I would love to hear you are taking away from today. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Absolutely. Appreciate the terms on more 
inclusive language, absolutely. Different like instead of different than us, absolutely. The intersectionality exercise, absolutely. Well, we can move into the Q&A portion of the uh, presentation. I know that, uh, oh, wait, can't skip over the resources. So listen, there are all there's so many resources that are available, but I did want to make sure that I shared a few that I leverage. Um, one of which I mentioned earlier in the presentation through Culture Ally, when we talk about the different se sexualities. And so while my presentation only had six or seven listed there, um, there are 26 that this site or this resource um, lists. And I, like I said, I know that there are several others out there, um, but. As you think about learning and continuing to evolve your lexicon, I encourage you to visit the first uh, link above. And then the PS learning video, the Lavender Scare, I saw someone say that NPR had a podcast about the Lavender Scare. I love that. Thank you for sharing that link. Would love for you to share it again. But the learning video that we had, the, that we showed at the beginning of the presentation is also linked here. GLAD has, um, a plethora of LGBTQ plus resources. Um, and so instead of listing all of those out, I just linked to that resource list. Uh, love some work that the Transgender Law Center is doing. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is a gender justice leadership program. I thought that that was very, very um, progressive and, and, and thought that that was worth highlighting. And then finally, as you know, I'm a mom of three. And so as I think about gender, sexuality, and the fluidity of it, I recognize that my children don't hold the same level of bias that I do because we we're growing up in different generations. And so I love what GLSN, GLSEN is doing um, around championing uh, LGBTQ plus issues in the K through 12 community. And so definitely wanted to link you all to that because as we think about the next, the future generation of the AmeriCorps, they're coming up, they're future leaders, and we want to know what's impacting them so that we can prepare for them to uh, serve as well. All right. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, um, Sharika. What an excellent, excellent presentation. Before you all go, please don't leave. We have a survey that we need you all to complete to tell us how amazing this presentation was. Um, by the way, I am Stedman Ware. The, the, uh, the, the survey link is right in the chat. We just put that up. So please do not leave before taking that survey. We need, need, need your feedback. Um, and so take that survey. Again, I'm Stedman Ware, Senior Advisor for Equity uh, in the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility. Um, we have some questions, uh, but I want to give you a moment to complete that survey. Please complete that survey. I'm going to post the link again so that you all can see it. This survey very much informs how we move forward with um, these sessions, how we grow this community, and how we continue to make sure that your voices are heard uh, throughout our time together. So I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds to, to complete that survey, and we'll post it again after we do Q&A. If you have any more questions, please submit them uh, in the Q&A uh, in the Q&A section. We we love questions. We love to we love to to hear even more from Sharika. I, I told Sharika, I'm like I love I love the 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 way that that you present. I love the way that you engage with the audience, and they certainly enjoy engaging with you. I can see that. All right, so I'm going. To, so I'm going to go um, with some of the questions that were previously submitted. I have, have some that, that have just been submitted. So uh, I'm going to sort through these as, as far as I can. Sharika, do I have you? I am here. Awesome. All right. So this is a question I, I did answer, um, but this I see this is a number that uh, a question that a number of individuals had questions about. Uh, where did the term lavender originate? Um, and so I went to, I, I've seen this, I've had the honor of seeing this, this premiere in person, actually, uh, when it first came out. And so the term lavender scare comes from the term lavender lads, which was used by Senator Everett Durkins in the, in the 1950s as a synonym for gay men. So that is where that term comes from uh, and, and how it was phrased. So if you have not seen that, that, that documentary, 
I definitely would encourage it. It is it is one uh it it can be difficult to watch, uh as some people mentioned, but it's definitely one that that will will certainly give you a grasp on the history um of the LGBTQ plus movement and and how the federal government was a part of that. All right. So um The next question is, can you review again the difference between being referred to as a woman versus a female? And why is this, uh, why is this considered derogatory? So I, I cannot speak to this personally. When you think about female, it's really connected to your chromosomes and your biology, right? how you're born. And sometimes um, what I have found is when you are referred to as woman, um, it's more humanizing. So contextually speaking, I try to avoid using the objectification of female just because it feels more like you're, redu you're only reduced to what's between your legs. If I'm just trying to be as honest and open as possible. Woman carries more personal uh, and cultural um, connotation with it and tone. It also is something that is, it aligns more with my identity and how I'm recognized in society. We talked a little bit about how, you know, I need as a and things because I, but when, um, when I think about female, it does capture the full identity of a person. And it almost feels being reduced to of who you are. And so I think woman is just much more inclusive. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, all right. So, um, and this next question could be, uh, we may end up having, going back to some of the slides, so you may speak to it directly, uh, Sharika. The difference between bisexual and pansexual. Yes, you can you pull up that slide for me? Um, or we can hold on a second. And we can come back to that one. Um yeah, I, I think it's we'll the next one and I'll get that for you. Yeah, we'll come back to that one. That's one that uh again we you know from a definition standpoint, we want to make sure and get that correct. Yes. So all right. Uh I'm going to some of the newer submitted questions. Okay, so here's a good, here's a really good one. How do we best support future transgender members interested in joining AmeriCorps programs without outing them within the process? Mm. Do you um can you speak to that statement? Because I don't know what are you all doing. Well, no, is there a part of the process, right? Um that calls into question their sexuality at all or their sexual orientation? And so I, again, I'm, for me, I can only speak from personal experience. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, I, I very much encourage that that silence about, you know, when we're answering these questions, making, you know, just taking a moment to think it in um, because that's something very important in making, making sure that our members feel that they have equity and that they have um, that they have that whatever kind of whether it's anonymity or complete openness as they come into the process, um, I don't I don't know that there is uh, I'm not sure that the application asked that question, mm -hmm. um, and so I I don't um, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. That's something I, I I would have to go and check for myself, but um, I certainly would say making sure. Uh, that our members have, you know, that they feel very feel comfortable, uh, whether they what depending on what their first interaction with uh, AmeriCorps recruitment might be, whether that's in person, whether that's online, making sure that our language is is equitable, um, and that we are reaching into different populations and into different groups. So I don't know right away if there is a if there is a barrier that currently exists. Um, at least from an application standpoint. Got you. That, that makes sense. I think, but from procedurally um, and from a process perspective, it'll 
it'll be interesting to see if um, there are support resources that are offered to applicants um, as they go through the process or if all the resources are offered to only those who are actually in the core. Yeah. Excellent. I think we only have, uh, we have a couple more. So what movements, if any, have you seen in the federal government um, towards gen gender, well, I'm gonna, and I'm, it says gender neutral bathrooms, but I'm gonna take it a step further um, when it comes to, I'm going to say, creating gender neutral spaces in the mm -hmm. federal government. Mm -hmm. um, in my 10-year career, I was proud to work at Homeland, the Department of Homeland Security, um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, to be exact, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, as well as um, OMB under the US, United States Digital Service. At CFPB, I remember, and that was probably 2014, I remember being in the space when we were able to um, offer gender neutral bathrooms. And it was a true push from the ERGs, quite honestly. Um, I have seen that um, at different agencies, but what I will tell you is I don't know what is happening across government. I can really only speak to what's happening within different departments and within different agencies. and. I encourage you all to participate in the employee resource groups that are formed within your different agencies and communities because those groups have so much more influence and support than you would think. And they can actually push for certain policies um, and um, spaces that are inclusive of everyone. So I don't know, I don't have the full answer for you, but I do know that there are specific agencies that are moving to that, to that standard. Okay. So we have a question. I'm just going to, um, this is, I think this is the last one that we can take at this time because we're moving, we're moving closer to the end of our time together. Uh, there's just um, someone that wanted to hear more about specific challenges with intersectionality in faith-based organizations. Um, can you speak to that? Um, and maybe some of the overarching policies um, related to that conversation? Ooh, that's a tough one. I that's a tough one. I cannot. Yes, um, because that is, I, um, the context to provide a a, a reasonable, res what I would consider a sufficient response to that question. Don't even and want to we, it. We appreciate that, and that's and maybe that's something we can build on as we as we mm -hmm. move. On community forward, you know, talking about, you know, some of the specific challenges with that. And, and, you know, I think it's, you know, and how we can, how we can create a safer space uh, to, to have those kinds of discussions. And especially when it comes to creating policy. Um, Absolutely. Very, very much so. Awesome. Sharika, this was such an amazing conversation, such an amazing exchange. Um, and for those, I I, I, hope, I I think we may have a couple more questions that we didn't get to, but I do see the names, so maybe we'll be able to reach out to them. Uh, and and um, I see there were some more questions into in the chat. Uh, we appreciate you guys' engagement so very much. Hopefully, you enjoyed this. Again, I'm going to paste the survey uh, in the chat for you all to complete. Um, there's also the QR code here. Um, so please, please, please take this survey and evaluate our time together. Um, Anthony, I don't, uh, I don't know if you got, if you have a chance to, to close us out. Um, but I, I want to at least say your name in the space. There you are. There you are. Awesome. Thank you, Stedman. And, uh, Sharika, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak, speak with, um, our, our, our community here today. Uh, really appreciate your time and, and your information. Um, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Hines. Um, I'm currently the Acting Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for AmeriCorps in our Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility. I really want to thank you all for showing up here today, whether it was whether you were actively participating in the chat via any reactions, the Q&A, or just in general reflecting with your intent and your contributions. They are so appreciated um, in, building, in building this space in this community. Uh, let's continue to grow the cultural community by sharing your feedback and encouraging others to register uh, and participate in future events. 
please don't forget to hit the survey monkey and give us uh, um, your feedback for today. And then also please uh, mark your calendars for uh, the third Thursday of each month. Uh, we are continuing this series uh, in this community and in this space until December. And so up next on Thursday, September 19th, uh, our topic for discussion will be managing mental health within the workplace. Uh, within this course, there will be practical strategies for promoting mental well-being in professional settings, addressing topics such as stress management, work-life balance, and destigmatizing mental health issues will be discussed. Um, attendees will attendees, excuse me, will also learn how to recognize signs of mental distress and then ways in which to support a work environment uh, that fosters a supportive work environment. Please don't wait, register today. All the links are on our website um, under, under the uh, equity page. And thank you again for joining us today and I'll see you next month on the third Thursday. Take care everyone. Thank you all, thank you, thank you.